Yielding to the Spirit, a history of St. John Baptist Church. This presentation of church history evolved from a collection of photographs, 16 millimeter film, videotapes, newspaper articles, and personal interviews. It highlights a span of eight decades, three historical sites, three visionary leaders, and a congregation of believers who have answered the call to action, believing that to whom much is given, much is required. Well, Reverend Bernie C. McCarley, who was the founder of this church, St. John Baptist Church, was born in Camden, South Carolina. And his family, they were farmers. But in 1922, the boll weevil, they had, they grew uh, cotton, and the boll weevil came by. That was, he destroyed the crop. So in 1923, he, he and his brother-in-law moved to Buffalo, New York. And his other brother came a little bit later. And we were like the central house. When people came from Camden, South Carolina, they stayed at our house. And so that was 1923. And so 1927, he organized the St. John Baptist Church. From several storefronts on William and Clinton Streets, the St. John Baptist Church moved to 92 Monroe Street in 1930. The Reverend Bernie C. McCarley, he and the four founding members, his sister-in-law, Mabel McCarley, his wife, Alice McCarley, and Joseph and Dora Kelly had kept their faith. The first deacon, Deacon Crockett, was ordained. In 1941, the Gospel Chorus rendered its first musical and began its musical journey. He received the calling in South Carolina, but he resisted. He didn't want to be a minister. He said his hair turned white because he wouldn't accept the calling. And then when he finally decided he was going to accept the calling, his hair returned black. He was uh, just a humble man. Uh, with uh, He built the church. He, he didn't have a lot of education, fourth or fifth grade education, but he had a way with people. He was a quiet man. Um, I, I'm speaking of observing him as a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, you never, I never seen him angry, never seen him hostile. He was just um, uh, passive in his approach. Let's move right into 92 mm -hmm. Monroe Street then and, um, and that structure. And stories that I have heard is that the family lived in the back. Of yep. the church? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So there, was, there were four, four children, children, my two brothers right. and my sister and myself. Okay. We lived at, in back of the church. We had the, uh, just the funniest arrangement, we had the kitchen and the dining room downstairs, downstairs and the living room yeah. and the bedrooms were upstairs. You remember that? Do I remember. <laughs> <laughs> We yeah. had the loveliest living room yeah. because it was upstairs. <laughs> the living room's upstairs. What we had mean? a beautiful dining room. <laughs> we sat around the dining room table for dinner. Yeah. Everyone had to be there for dinner <laughs> unless you gave your excuse. We never ate separate. In fact, Jane and I was discussing poverty. Mm -hmm. We never knew it. We thought we were... <laughs> Well to do. Yeah. We, didn't, we didn't know we were poor. <laughs> After one year, with the membership still under 10, Reverend McCarley had considered giving up his church. But in a vision, he was taken to a large church and shown a huge congregation over which he would pastor. Believing in God's vision, he continued his labor. Families from South Carolina had also migrated north and joined St. John Baptist Church the Stovers, the Browns, the Johnsons, and others. I remember 
going to the old St. John on Spruce and Sycamore and the Bells was the young group that, at that time. They were the young folks and I, I, Reverend W.B. Seals had organized the Bells. He was uh, one of the ministers at St. John with Reverend McCarley and he gave the Bells their name and Mrs. Whitehead was the pianist. Andrew Brown was the director. He was truly a man of music. And I sat in the audience and I loved to sing. And it wasn't long before I joined the Bells. And I remember many, many persons uh, that are now gone. Uh, Rube Savage was one of the members. Uh, Judy Dixon sang in the in the Bells. Alice, uh, what's Alice's name? Reed. Alice Reed was a member. And we just had a, a magnificent group of people. Bonnie Copeland was in the, in the choir. Her husband, Leon Copeland. We just had, it was one of the largest choirs because it was just the, it, 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 it needed to be called the Bells because it was so melodious, the sounds of the Bells. My name is Dorothy Tolbert and I joined the Bells in 1948. I loved the Bells. It was all men president. We had three male presidents, and I was the first lady. Yes. And I held the office for 30 years. Who was it? Herman Potts was and one of the presidents? And I loved the judge. It was Rube Savage, Hummer Potts, Frank Kirkwood. And they was all laughing because I was the first lady, but the lady held it longer than any of them. So we really had a lot of fun praising the Lord, and I really enjoyed it. As I listen to the song from Zion being sang by our choir, my mind goes back years ago when Reverend McCauley was alive. He was our best a humble man with a Moses-like spirit and vision. I remember Reverend Cowley decided to sing a song entitled That is what I want my Lord to sing. Everyone in the congregation He was not a great singer, but he loved singing. I do love singing. My family was blessed with talent that enabled us to lift our voices and praise the Lord. I began singing when I was 10. An exponent of the St. John 4. I'm going back years ago. I'm going back to the 40s, possibly to the 30s. And he decided to have the Brown brothers imitate the St. John's 4. And he called Abram, who was the youngest, Andrew. Milton and my brother Matthew, my son. And we formed a quartet. And we were known then as the Brown with the blue guys. But it was a beautiful thing. And from there we got, gained a, a reputation of being singers. St. John Gospel Chorus came into existence and we would have uh, musical programs every fourth Sunday evening. It got so that our reputation grew until we started inviting all types of singers from the Southlands and everywhere in the country, from California, Georgia, and everywhere. The caravan was a great time. And seemingly, the Spirit of God just led us to where we are today. 
And I'm proud to say that I'm grateful and humbled to be a member of the St. John's Baptist Church. But we would have the opportunity to stay with Grandma. It was Grandma and Papa. It was eight of us, Janie's two and, and Mother's six. And we would all be in that house together. And Grandma would say, you chaps, you got to go in there and clean that church up. And that meant we had to dust and vacuum because you only had carpet, I think, down the middle mm -hmm. and on the sides. So we had to go in and vacuum and dust and get the hymn books and the Bibles and everything together and the fans. So when we would get in there, all eight of us, we would start playing church. <laughs> My oldest brother, Wesley, he would be the minister, of course. <laughs> Lorraine would be the piano player, because she played. Um, Tessie, I don't know, Tessie and probably Bernie and myself, we were the choir. Then Lorraine would get off the piano and she would be Miss So-and-so in the church that got happy all the time. Then we would run with the fans and fan her and oh, we just had a good time. They used to go up in the steeple of the church and kill pigeons. <laughs> Lawrence and Bernie and Wesley, they used to they had them BB guns and shoot pigeons. We used to play with the pipe organ up there. We used to jump from the balcony down to the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Telling everything. Yeah. <laughs> we had good times in that church. We really did. I was uh, the secretary of the Sunday school. I remember that. Deacon Elijah Brown was the superintendent. Mm -hmm. And every Christmas, he would give me a box of cherries. <laughs> and I hated cherries, chocolate covered cherries, <laughs> every year. <laughs> But that was your pay. No, no, no he just he just gave you know uh -huh. the officers you know come back to know a box of candy, but with chocolate them chocolate covered cherries you know. <laughs> you were the church secretary for a long time. Well, that, that's that at one eighty three Sycamore. Oh, no, but I was the secretary <laughs> for the church when we moved to Sycamore. Then I became the full time church clerk, mm -hmm. and I gave. Ten dollars a month. That was your pay. That was my pay. <laughs> you got twenty dollars. Ten dollars. Ten dollars a, a, a month. That's a lot. <laughs> Wait till I tell you what we got. <laughs> and I kept that job until I was about eighteen years old. And I told my sister, "Could you take over the job for me for a little while?" And she accommodated me by taking over the clerk, a job that she held for the next 25 years. <laughs> Although we were poor, we were all poor, but we always got along. We were like sisters and brothers mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of cousins. That's right. mm -hmm. and one thing that Reverend Heaven never ever had to move a soul about was the money. Because my father was the treasurer of the church for 42 years. <laughs> and never a dime was yep. missing. That's right. He kept money straight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember one time the money was missing. Oh, yeah. That oh, was the time oh, when oh, yeah. the church was robbed uh -huh. while they were in service. Uh -huh. Okay, And I just happened to be on the outside of the church, across the street, where Sister Andrews, Andrews. was living. Uh -huh. And I'm watching them coming down the stairs. They had handkerchiefs across their faces. And I watched them bring the safe down, put it in the trunk of a car, and rolled off. <laughs> So after service, people were saying, we've been robbed, we've been robbed. So when I went in the church, I told them, I said, well, I've seen them. So they jumped me. Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you say something? I said, because y'all always told me, don't never interrupt worship service. And my grandfather told him, leave him alone. That's what we told him, leave him alone. 
And that was one time the money was missing. <laughs> <laughs> Building at Sycamore and Spruce Streets would no longer comfortably accommodate the church's needs, so a building fund drive began. And the groundbreaking for that new church at 184 Goodell was held on March 3rd, 1965. The entire church, including ministers, choirs, ushers, and the congregation attended the ceremony. The new structure would nearly double the seating for a growing congregation and the five choirs. Just to acquire this property, um, and uh, I mean, we sit on 28 acres now, but all of it uh, stems from uh, the initial, uh, um, his initial purchasing of this property and uh, with the foresight uh, that this would one day be a thoroughfare into downtown Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Now this is back in 1965. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, uh, yes, most certainly we, we, we have to call him a visionary and, and a builder because um, out of what he envisioned, uh, all of this was birthed. And even what we're doing now is birthed out of uh, the simplicity of his character. And, um, and so we're, I mean, we're, we're thankful to that. And God has brought individuals on that would build upon uh, the previous generations, given us spiritual continuity and continuity in the development of uh, where the church ought to go. We, we, where every time there's, a, there's been a change of pastor, there has not been a drastic change in uh, the direction. Uh, we, we might have short-term plans, but they fold into the long-term plans and history of the church. So it's consistent, and, and we're thankful to that. In March 1972, Reverend Bernie C. McCarley was called from labor to reward. He had preached to the 1,000-member congregation just as he had seen in his vision. That same year, 1972, the Reverend Bennett W. Smith Sr. was called to assume the leadership of St. John Baptist Church. A native of Florence, Alabama, Reverend Smith continued to move St. John forward as he led the church to burn the mortgage, organize a credit union, sponsor a mission station, and organize a nonprofit 150 garden type apartment housing development within the church. He also led the church in the completion of a nine-story, 150-unit senior citizen complex directly behind the church. He was intense, no nonsense, you know. He was, um, he, he, he had a tremendous regard and knowledge for ministry, pastoral ministry, church. He had a great insight into personalities uh, and dispositions of church people. He knew how to handle church people. And he would always say to me, you know, don't, you know, you don't, you don't have to preach like me. You don't have to be like me. There might be some things that I do that you might not think is absolutely right. But I'm pastor and God has sent me here. And I've always remembered that. So he and he he knew how to conduct him. He was quick on his feet. I mean, I've seen him in just the spur of the moment, spontaneous situations, but he always, I've never seen him not have the appropriate thing to say. And I've seen him call on him to preach. I've seen him call on him for, to make decisions, to chair meetings of major players. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was always, he, he was always prepared as if he had had time to prep. Mm -hmm. And so he, he taught me how spontaneous ministry can be mm -hmm. and that you need to have a wide diversity of thought and perception and not be narrow, 
Whether you agree or not, you need to be able to enter dialogue, have dialogue, to keep the channels open. Mm -hmm. So he, he was a, a trem tremendous soul, a tremendous spirit, and um, a, a tremendous gift, mm -hmm. a tremendous gift mm -hmm. to the church community. Mm -hmm. I hereby confer upon you the Reverend Bennett Walker Smith, Sr., the degree of Doctor of Divinity Honoris Causa, with all rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. happened his death happened suddenly I mean it was unexpected we were in the midst of a building project the life center and so I had to pick up the fundraising we got in the middle of it and the pastor uh, died right in, in the middle of the project and I know he wanted wanted to see the project complete he talked to me about the project about that we needed to raise additional funds so that was my task he, when, when the pastor died, he left me with a task. We need to get this up. We need to get it completed. We need to make sure it's financially stable. Mm -hmm. 
So that was my task immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, his death was, I believe, August 7th, uh, 2001. November of 2002, I was officially uh, 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 appointed to this position. Um, and so it was a lot of stress on family and a lot of stress on my wife. And we were just glad for it to be over. But it was a great task. But at that day, I remember something Dr. Smith said to me late, late in the in the final months of his life. We was in the pulpit, and he told everyone to grab someone and pray for him. And he grabbed me and prayed for me, and he told me, "Don't be afraid." He said, "Don't be afraid." He said, "God will be with you." That's what he said. And I took that with me, even today. We're doing quite a bit of development, brick and mortar, but that provides services. Got an older congregation. Quite a few folk have went through hospice. Dr. Smith went through hospice. And uh, so we needed to have a hospice facility down here. It's been a little more elusive than what we thought, but we're working at it, and so we believe it will come to fruition soon. We're doing housing, 28 townhouses. It's a $6 million tax credit. But folks need quality, uh, quality living conditions. And so all that we're doing is really social justice. We have an obligation as a church to remove any barriers that keep people from coming closer to God. And I'm a combination of the past pastors. Mm -hmm. That's probably um, that, uh, that uh, there is some humility. Uh, but if necessary, he can be stern, if necessary. And that I have uh, developed a balance between the former pastors. Um, that's probably how I would want to be, um, to be remembered. Uh, um, to be remembered as a heavy focus on ministry, really on ministry. But those are the types of things that I would want them to, uh, to see me as if I needed to define a legacy that would stay on after I'm gone. As the spirits of our ancestry continue to unfold, it is our dream that the present generation and subsequent generations will have a sense of pride over the impact that the St. John Baptist Church has made within this religious community in Buffalo, New York.